Good morning. Welcome to Green Hill Church. Let's stand together and worship this morning. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a attention to the screen. This one is for you from Jesus. Jesus loves you, my friend. Jesus loves you. He loves you so much. I received these gloves that I really love. It's my favorite color. <laughs> yes. And I received this awesome mask that I'm going to scare my little sister and brother in the night with. <laughs> yes. And this pants. And I'm going to use them in every book I have for school. And these awesome socks. And yeah, I just love it. I felt a great moon. I felt excited. This is my favorite thing. Nah. It makes me feel like Jesus loves me. Yes. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it brings this feeling to my heart that 
there's somebody out there that wants to share God's word and even though we feel lost that God is not there, that yes, God exists and he hears our prayers. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, holiday season, and this is the time for Operation Shoebox, Operation Christmas Child, the shoeboxes. And so many of you took boxes last week. Uh, they were available. They're still available today. We've got a lot more boxes. So this is a really incredible way that we've uh, been able to participate in a long time for you and your family to uh, bless the world and uh, share Jesus and the love of Christ with people in a faraway place. And so the boxes are out there. Uh, take them. Again, a lot of you took a box last week. Thank you. The key is bringing them back. That's really the key. Just, you know, full and packed full, full of stuff. And so um, Casey will give you a few more instructions later this morning. But I'm really glad you're here. I'm going to let you remain seated for a moment. But we're going to read Psalm 46. This is an important week uh, in the life of our nation. It's an election week. We'll um, have a, this is a beginning of the week of prayer. We've just said, hey, we're going to take this week in a special way. Um, we're going to take some time off uh, individually, uh, dedicate some additional time to prayer and to fasting. So I hope you'll do that, whether it's uh, for a meal that you fast, you just skip breakfast and instead spend some extra time in the Word and in prayer, or you skip breakfast and lunch, uh, you skip an entire day. Um, whatever it may be, just so that you can uh, say, you know, Lord, I'm going to set this time apart uh, to seek you on behalf of our uh, community, on behalf of our state, on behalf of our nation. These are important days. And so uh, I hope that you'll kind of step into that. Uh, it's an important time for us. Um, Psalm 46, though, I'm going to ask you to read out loud with me. You can stay seated uh, as long as you read. Loud and with feeling. I think you'll appreciate this psalm today. It goes like this. God is our refuge and strength. A helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore we will not be afraid. Though the earth trembles and the mountains topple. Into the depths of the sea. Though its waters roars and, and foams. And the mountains quake with its turmoil. There is a river. Its streams delight the city of God the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is within her. She will not be toppled. God will help her when the morning dawns. Nations rage and kingdoms topple. The earth melts when He lifts His voice. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, see the works of the Lord who brings devastation on the earth. He makes wars cease throughout the earth. He shatters bows and cuts spears into pieces and he sets wagons ablaze. Stop fighting and know that I'm God. Exalted among the nations, exalted on the earth. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Would you pray with me? Lord, the nations rage, kingdoms topple. But our God, He stands forever. We bless your name today. You are our refuge in time of trouble. You're our bulwark, our fortress who never fails. You are our God and therefore we will not fear. We will instead respond in faith, trust. We will delight in you and find our satisfaction in you alone. Lord, we do pray for our, our community, our nation. We, we, we pray that, Lord, you would have your way during these days. And you would accomplish your purposes that you've set out for us. And that the people of God would be a living testimony of salt and light in the world. The redeeming hope that is ours in Jesus alone. Lord, we don't know what's going to happen on Tuesday, but you do, and you're already way ahead of us. You hold us in your hands, and we trust you. 
May today as we meet together, whether we're here in person or we're tuning in online, oh God, may today uh, we find our hope in you, renew our trust in you, and may many people move from death to life today in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning and welcome to Green Hill Church. We're glad that you've joined us, uh, whether you're in person or online. Thank you for being here and worshiping with us this morning. Um, if you are a first-time visitor, a first-time guest, uh, we ask that you would go to greenhillchurch.com and there is a, a blue button that says Connect Card. If you could click on that, fill that information out for us, that would be great. Uh, we can know how to serve you better and uh, know how we can pray for you and things like that. So um, I, I said this in the first service. Um, you know, it's such a, a, an awesome opportunity for us to come together and get to worship the Creator. When's the last time that you actually thought about that? You really sat down and, and you just leaned into that, that we get to worship God Almighty, the Creator. He wants to have a relationship with us. Um, it's, it's such an awesome opportunity. And so we're going to continue in worship and let's all stand together and sing. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more.
His mercy is more. Sorrow comes to steal the joy I own. When brokenness and pain is all I know, well, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I. Stand in your love, my fear. It doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not. 
we call on your name would you make this a place for your glory to dwell open the blind eyes unlock the deaf ears come to your people as we draw near hear us from heaven touch our generation your people crying out in desperation. Lord, hear our cry. Come near our land. Breathe life into the
You'll turn in your Bible to Jonah chapter 1. Jonah is an Old Testament prophet, or prophet from the Old Testament. So it's a, it's a small little book. So use your table of contents if you need to. Uh, it's not hard to find if you're using page numbers. So just do that if you need to. If you've got a smart device or something else, just look it up. But Jonah is one of the minor prophets, not because his work is not significant, it's just short. Uh, you probably like a minor preacher, <laughs> you know, one that's shorter than a major preacher, which is a little bit longer, like Isaiah or Jeremiah. So um, the substance is not inferior, but it's uh, just a shorter book. And um, I wonder if that's your heart cry today that we've just sung, that he would hear us <clears throat> from heaven. Is that your heart cry today? I, I hope that it is. I, I hope that we have find, are finding our place at a you know at this point in history, recognizing that power and that influence and prosperity and education and technology aren't quite enough to satisfy the human heart or turn the hearts of a world to Jesus. I hope perhaps we've come to the end of our rope and found that Jesus is enough. So I'm beginning this series uh, from Jonah this morning. It's seven, we're, we'll be here seven weeks, Lord willing, and uh, leading up to December 13th, I think we are scheduled to finish this series, but we're calling it Seven Moments That Saved the World, and we believe that there's a crisis of belief that God, when God speaks to us, there's a decision that we have to make. When God moves in our hearts, there's a decision that we have to make. And um, here's the way Jesus said it. You may remember in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking about the wise builder who built on the, the rock and the foolish who built on the sand. In that context, he says this, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do the things that I say to do? And you might be really quick to answer that question. What's well, sinfulness? It's rebellious. We're defiant. And all of those things are true. But perhaps if we uh, dig a little bit deeper, we find that there's, there, there's some disconnect that's really important. In other words, there's this gap between our profession of, of faith that Jesus is Lord and the way that we actually live our lives. Where does that gap come from? What is the makings of that? And it leads us to ask a few questions. It leads me to be curious about a few things. As a pastor and follower of Christ with you, uh, let me ask you these. Uh, when, when was the last time that God told you to do something? I'm not asking when the last time you heard from me, or heard Him in an audible voice. I, I don't suspect many of us will have that experience, but some of you may. But, but I'm speaking, when... when when do you know that He's impressed upon you, that He has spoken to you, that he has, he has led you? When was the last time God spoke to you, told you to do something? What did He tell you to do? What was it that He was doing in you or through you? How did you respond? What was required of you? Um, how did it affect the other relationships in your life and how other people viewed you or didn't view you? What assumptions or previously held beliefs did it challenge? Today we meet Jonah. Jonah was a prophet of Israel uh, during the reign of Jeroboam II, 17, or 786 to 486, somewhere in there. And uh, it was an important time in a divided kingdom. Uh, here's a little bit of history. Here's we don't know a lot about Jonah outside of the book of Jonah. but So I'm going to take a little time this morning um, to help provide us some context that I hope will help us. Here's 2 Kings chapter 14. In the 15th year of Judah's king Amaziah, son of Joash, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. So the kingdom of Israel, or the people of God, were divided into two kingdoms. Israel to the north with Samaria as its capital, Judah to the south with Jerusalem as its capital. Odd thing that God's people would be divided, but they, they were. And um, so 
uh, Jonah was a prophet to the northern kingdom, Israel. Jeroboam II was the king here. And he did what was evil in the Lord's sight, the text tells us. He did not turn away from all the sins Jeroboam, son of Nabat, had caused Israel to commit. He restored Israel's border from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of Araba, uh, Araba, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, who had spoken through his servant, the prophet Jonah, son of Amittai, from Gath Hefer. For the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter for both slaves and free people. There was no one to help Israel. The Lord had not said he would blot out the name of Israel under heaven, so he delivered them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash. So Israel is governed by an evil, wicked king. Yet um, Jonah had favor with him, helped him secure the border to protect his people, had um, given him some advice or a word from God, and Jeroboam actually followed that advice. It was an important moment in the life of Israel. It protected them. And so Jonah was not only a favored prophet or one that was looked upon with favor from Jeroboam II, but he was also a patriot. He loved his people. That was a good thing. He cared about his people, wanted to protect his people, just like you or I would. We lock our doors at night usually. We uh, locked our doors in the car, the parking lot out here before we uh, came in. We There's nothing wrong with wanting to secure your stuff or to keep your people safe. And Jonah uh, was in that category. And it was also true that although um, Jeroboam was not a good king, he was an evil king, God had made a promise to preserve his people. And so he uh, used Jonah and others to um, show grace and kindness to Jeroboam and to his people. Jonah had the ear of the king. He was a patriot who loved his people, which makes the first words of this story that may be familiar to some of us so difficult. Uh, One would think that when God speaks to us, we would respond with enthusiasm. Like when if God spoke to you, we would think that this would be a good moment for us. Like if you received a phone call right now from some famous or very influential person, you knew it was them on the other line when, when you saw their, their name comes up or their phone number comes up, and you, you know it's a famous or powerful, influential person, you would, I mean, I hate to admit it, but you would leave the room and take the call. You would take the call, hope, and if he does call or she does call, please leave the room to take the call, just to... Uh, FYI there, but leave the room, take the call, go out to the parking lot, discuss whatever matters on his or her mind, and you would more than likely do exactly everything you could to do exactly what uh, was being asked of you. But that wasn't Jonah's response to God, and it's often not our response to him either. Now, we may have heard of Jonah, you may have heard of Jonah because of part of the story that includes him being swallowed but not digested by a large fish. It was a a miraculous kind of thing and you may have a little bit of tension with that. Does that, could that really happen? Actually the entire, this entire season of Jonah's life was marked by the supernatural miraculous intervention of God. God sent a, a great storm on the sea as he was trying to escape that frightened these seasoned sailors. He, he, uh, they, they cast lots to see who was responsible, and the lot divinely appointed fell to Jonah. He then, God did, send a, sent a fish to swallow Jonah and kept him for three days until he spit him up on dry land. He gave the wicked city of Nineveh a heart of repentance. He grew a plant to provide shade for Jonah, And then he sent a worm to destroy the plant overnight. And then the Bible tells us that God sent a scorching east wind to bring misery upon Jonah. So, if you happen to object to Jonah's story because of the miraculous supernatural intervention of God, then you're going to have a really hard time with Jesus. 
The very foundations of our faith are rooted in the miraculous, supernatural intervention of God. You can go all the way back to the beginning, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The, the, the first miracle, miracle number one, tells us that God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases, Psalm 115.3. Here's the way Paul the Apostle described his um, amazement in who God is and what he's done. He says, oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? And who has ever given to God that he should be repaid? And then listen to verse 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. The story of God is the story of the miraculous, supernatural intervention of God. Its climax is when Jesus was sent through the Virgin Mary and lived in a sinless life and died an innocent death, was crucified for your sins and on your behalf and was buried on the third day, was raised to life. That is the good news of the gospel and it's rooted in the supernatural, miraculous intervention of a holy God. So if you've got some trouble or some objections to Jonah, you'll really have to take that up with Jesus, who himself said this, for as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Listen, we have no hope in God at all. Our faith is a complete sham apart from the gracious, miraculous, supernatural intervention of a holy God. So back to the story. In, in a day that God's word wasn't as common for someone to hear as it is today that we would have the Bible to hold and read in our hands. Um, in a day when a prophet would be highly esteemed if he did perhaps hear a fresh word from God. In a day where people were desperate to hear from God, things were not good in Israel. They were being pressed in upon by their enemy Assyria. We'll meet in a moment. But they were also being corrupted from within by evil kings. It was a desperate moment for his people. In a moment like that, you would think that Jonah would be ecstatic when God spoke to him. But he wasn't. Here's the question. Pretty lengthy introduction, but. What was it that God said that caused so much anxiety in Jonah that would lead him to run away from God? I mean, what could God have said that would have caused Jonah to go in the exactly opposite direction, willing to go farther away than Nineveh ever would have been? What would have been so provocative to make Jonah respond that way? Well, let's read it together. Would you stand in honor of God's word? We're going to read two verses, Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Here we go. After I read this, I'll share a short prayer and then you can be seated for a moment. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because their evil has come up before me. There it is. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for your word and that you do still speak. Lord, we know that there is a gap between your words and our obedience. We know that there is a conflict in our soul. There's a sanctifying work you want to do. There's a saving work you want to do today in the heart of unbelievers. And there's a fresh work you want to do in the heart of believers. 
We pray you'd do that. Your Holy Spirit would have freedom in these moments that our hearts would be full of yours. We pray in the strong and sweet name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you so much. So we don't know exactly where Jonah was when the Lord spoke to him. We suspect he was somewhere around Samaria. He may have had a condo, you know, in the inner city where he was available to the king, or he may have had a little ranch at outside of town where he raised some, uh, some crops or some animals or whatever it was. We don't really know, but we suspect that his accommodations were a little bit better than the average person's accommodations. He had favor in the court, king's court. He had access to, to the king. He uh, had a voice there. And so we just suspect that he was not in an incredibly uncomfortable situation personally. Obviously, the nation was in turmoil, a lot going on there. But we suspect that he had it a little bit better than most people had it. But God spoke to him there. And God could have said a lot of things to him. He could have said, listen, you need to go to your king and you need to, you know, speak truth and love to him. And and, um, you need to call him to repent of his evil deeds and so on. He didn't do that. He could have had him preach unity and love to this divided kingdom of Israel and and, uh, Judah and said, listen guys, we we got to get together. That would have been a fine message and uh, unity and love is important themes in the Gospels. But he didn't call him to that. In other words, he called him to something much more specific. He broke the silence, gave him instructions to get up. Literally, rise from where you are and go travel to the city of Nineveh. I want you to be a missionary, what we would know as a missionary, and I want you to preach to the people of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was not only a pretty big city in size and population, 130,000 folks or so, the greater Nineveh area was probably bigger than that. It was also great in evil. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, which uh, was, again, pressing in on Israel. No question about that. And imposed and acted with great cruelty on all of its enemies. And um, if it didn't destroy you with horrible vengeance, it enslaved you with deplorable conditions. Assyria has been described by most historians, or by many historians, rather, as a terrorist state. At this point in history, Shalmaneser III was the emperor, and he was known for torturing and dismembering his captured enemies. One practice that was not uncommon for him was when he captured an enemy, he would have his legs, both legs cut off and one arm cut off, so that he would be forced to shake hands with his victor in humiliation before he bled out. These are the kind of people that God was calling Jonah to. They were terrorists, a little bit like Al-Qaeda would be viewed as today. He called them to leave his relative safety and security of his own home and put himself in harm's way with an enemy that he really didn't like at all. He was called to leave a people who knew him and highly esteemed him and go to a people who probably saw him as an enemy and wanted Um, to kill him. But the worst of it we see in Jonah's own confession in chapter 4, verse 2. He says to the Lord, after Nineveh had repented, he says, I knew that you were gracious and compassionate, God. He's saying this in, you know, frustration. I knew that you, I knew you would do this. I knew you were gracious and compassionate, God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love. And one who relents from sending disaster. I, I knew. I knew. That's the reason I ran in the other direction. I knew how you would treat these people who I despised. Jonah did not think about Nineveh the way that God thought about Nineveh. And this is our first clue in the story that the focus of God's work here is not Nineveh at all, but Jonah. So let's consider what's happening when God sends us to the world, much of whom we really don't think a lot of. 
Number one, God sends us to the world first by first coming to us. And it says that right there in the text, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Jonah was a prophet of God. He was, in our terminology, a believer. In New Testament terminology, he was saved. He uh, was a follower of Christ. And we would even use in some circles like this, we would say he was called to vocational ministry. That is, for a living, he preached the Bible. He taught the Bible. He gathered people together to worship God. He spoke for God. All of that. It's interesting. We'll see next week as we watch him run. And he pays the fare to escape the presence of God with the proceeds that he receives from doing the work of God. Isn't that interesting? The Bible teaches us that if we're in Christ, we are saved. But we're also being saved. And we also will be saved. The idea is not that our salvation is kind of like in a, a question. Not at all. No the idea is that our salvation is a certainty. We have our assurance of salvation. If you're in Christ, you're always in Christ. You've been, as Ephesians tells us, sealed until the day by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. But that also means that God is very active in finishing in you what He began. In other words, when He, he seals us with the Holy Spirit, He also fills us with the Holy Spirit. Who is, whose job is to do a sanctifying work in us. We see this in Philippians chapter 2. Paul says it this way, Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation and with fear and trembling. Not work for your salvation, that's not at all the case. But work it out in fear and trembling, for it is how God who is at work in you both to will and and to work according to His good purpose. Listen, before the, before the word of the Lord got to Nineveh, the word of the Lord had to get to Jonah. Before the gospel gets to your neighbors and to the nations, it's got to get to you and to me. Before the world hears they have hope, you and I have to be honest with God about who is our hope. Before we can reach the world, Jesus has got to reach us. Perhaps the first work of global evangelism and missions, perhaps the first work of city transformation, perhaps the first work of transformation in the public square that we all long for is not in the unreached people group in a faraway place or the stubborn hearts down the road or in the capital or wherever else we want to assume they are, but yet in the unreached, darkened corners of our own hearts. Perhaps the greatest missionary the world has ever known is the Holy Spirit, who God sent to us to live within us, to sanctify us for His glory. See, working out our own salvation with fear and trembling is a rigorous work. I, I suspect, and I don't, I'll just say this, I don't really, I know we use the word nominal Christian. I think I know what we mean by that. I'm just not sure I believe in one of those. That is, a, a Christian who just uh, has a name Christian, but isn't a follower of Christ. I just don't know that that's a thing. Um. But here's, here's, here's my point. The rigorous work of the Holy Spirit is going to cost you something. It's a rigorous work. That's the reason I think a lot of us tap the brakes and say, you know, I know that I got saved when I was six. I, I know that I got saved when I was 12. I mean, I went down the aisle. I got baptized when I was 12. And, but what God's asking me right now, I'm not willing to give him. The way it's going to affect my relationships, I'm just not prepared for that. The way it's going to affect my vocation, I'm just not prepared for that. The way it's going to affect my money or my, my marriage or, or my family, I'm just not prepared for that. So I'm going to tap the brakes and I'm going to go to church a couple times a month and, I, and I'm, I'm going to affirm a lot of things and I'm going to rely, here's what I'm going to do, I'm going to rely on Christian cliches. And I'm going to rely on this, this kind of coffee mug Christianity that, that's just got cute little slogans all over the place 
but I'm not really interested in working out my salvation with fear and trembling because there's some work here that I'm really not prepared to face. That's where we find Jonah as the word of the Lord came to him. Perhaps God finds us in that spot more than we would like to believe. God sends us to the world by first coming to us. Secondly, God sends us to the world by finding us where we are. It says, it says that Jonah was the son of Amittai. You know who Amittai was? Yeah, me either. Well, we really don't know. You know, we really don't know who he is. We don't know a lot about him. I've read a lot of books on Jonah lately. I've done a lot of work on uh, researching Jonah and so on. But nobody really knows anything about his daddy. Here's what we know. That he had a daddy. We know he came from somewhere. We know he came from somewhere. We know that he was shaped by his family experiences and beliefs. We know he grew up in an environment that had impacted the way he lived and the way he thought about people. So when he heard the word Nineveh, that evokes certain emotions and feelings. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Like if you're, like if, if you're from the South and I say the word Yankee, <laughs> you know, it's like that. If you're from the North and, you say, and I say the word Southerner, you know what I'm talking about. It's not always a positive thing. But here's what happens. Based on a very limited amount of information, we make large judgments where they're from, what they look like, what language they speak. We make a lot of assumptions about people based on a very small amount of information. I grew up in Tullahoma, Tennessee, right? So we had opinions about people that, you know, were from Shelby. You know what I mean? If you're from here, you know, Shelbyville. We, they, they just say they're from Shovel. They're from Bedford County. We don't believe those people deserve sunshine. You know what I mean? We just don't, we don't know what that is. Based on a very limited amount of information, we make vast judgments about people. Jonah was in that category. There's a lot of things wrong about that. But here, here's what we know, and here's what should give us some hope, all right? God knows all about your background. He knows where you're from, who raised you. He knows your biases. He knows the dark places of bigotry when he comes to us. He, he knows who your daddy is. He knows every heart-shaping experience of your life. He knows your personality, your preferences. He knows the things that you hope for and dream for, dream about. He knows your insecurities, the things that keeps you up at night, the things that intimidate you about other people or about other experiences. He knows the pain those other people have caused you. And what we may use as an excuse to say no, this is the good part, he uses as a basis for saying, go, I got a good work to do. Through your miserable soul. I got a good work to do. No matter where you've come from. No matter what you think about those people. I've got a work to do in you. That is absolutely amazing. Your biases. Your preferences. They are no match. For the transforming work of the gospel. Jonah hated the Ninevites. Because many of his people had been hurt by many of their people. They were his enemy. They were the enemy of his people. That's all Jonah really knew when he heard the word Nineveh. He didn't know any Ninevites specifically that we know about. He didn't, he didn't know their names, where they're coming from, what their dreams are, what they think about their current political situation. He didn't know anything about that. But when he heard the word Ninevites, it created such, it provoked him in such a way that he was willing to run away from from God. So while he had started out being a faithful patriot, caring about his people, he had become a nationalistic bigot. But God knew that. And in his great mercy, did not leave Jonah captive to his natural biases, his anger, or his fears. The people of Nineveh were more than Jonah's opinion of them. That's good news for all of us. 
Back in the summer, our family went on a little trip to the Smoky Mountains, rented a house for a few days, just goofed off. One particular day, some people in our family decided they wanted to walk across a swinging glass bridge uh, hanging suspended between two mountains. Uh, the two smarter, more intellectually superior people in the family made a different decision, and we went across the street, and we got on a space needle, which still scared the living daylights out of me, but it was still shorter than the swinging glass bridge of death. And so when Lane and I got up to the platform, we found these, um, this viewfinder, basically binoculars on a pole that you could look through, and you could actually look across the street, across the valley a little bit, and see... Uh, our precious family members, uh, riding a chairlift up the side of the mountain. You know, when they run that, that thing up the mountain, you have to s sit there a while while they're loading it, right? You know what I'm talking about, like a ski lift, right? And so we saw them dangling in midair, you know, death-defying um, acrobatics. And then we were able to look through the binoculars, and we were able to see them when they got over to the platform outside of this bridge, and we got to watch them kind of walk over the bridge and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, we got up there and I said, hey, Lane, come and look, look at this, look through this. What do you mean? I, well, you know, it's not that we didn't know what our family looked like. But we were able to see them as far away as they were through lenses. Like the naked eye couldn't see all that was. So we come over to the viewfinder, and you look through the viewfinder, and you can see these people that are far away from you. You can see what they're wearing. You can see that they're talking to one another. You can see a lot about them that you couldn't see without the lenses, without the binoculars, without the magnification. I imagine the Lord was saying to Jonah, come over here and Look through these binoculars and see these people. I know they're 550 miles from where you are. I know that politically they're just crazy. I know that they want to see the demise of you and your people. I know that they're dangerous in many respects. But I want you to see them the way I see them. Come and see what I see. They're more than Ninevites. That's the beauty of the gospel. That wherever he finds us, Jesus gives us new eyes to see people the way he sees people where they are. And the gospel is powerful to redeem our genetic code and our family background and our deeply held presuppositions to break through bigotry or biases and so we can see people the way he sees people. You say, you know, why is that so important? I mean, do we just need to you know, hold hands, sing kumbaya and have warm, fuzzy feelings as we watch you know, Hallmark Channel movies? Is that what this is all about, just us feeling good about ourselves and feeling like, you know, I had a friend of mine this week. He said, you know why all the, you know, he didn't say it exactly. I'm kind of, I need to miss, I need to be careful. But he almost said it like this. He said, you know, I really think a lot of white people just adopt a black people because of white, white guilt. That's what he said. He said, it's just white guilt. Well, I don't know really anybody's motives. I really don't. I don't know anybody's motives. But I, the people I know that have adopted kids, whether they're stateside or somewhere else, is out of a gospel motivation. Those are the people. I mean, it's a gospel motivation. Because if you're adopting for warm fuzzies, you, you, you've been misinformed. Why is it that God wants us to see people the way he sees people? Here, here's what he says. He says, God wanted to make known among the Gentiles. You and me, those other people. The glorious wealth of this mystery. Which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. We proclaim him. Warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present every one mature in Christ. 
God doesn't put lenses on you to see people the way He sees people so that you'll just have some warm kind of feelings and satisfy whatever guilt you have about being privileged. He gives us lenses to see people the way He sees people because His goal is to make known the glorious wealth that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Number three, and I need to finish. God sends us to the world with a message of mercy. He says it this way, verse 2, it's really clear. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because their evil has come up before me. Here's what Anthony Carter says. He says, the grand and gracious storyline of the Bible is God reaching down to to be gracious to rebels. That's the whole storyline of redemptive history. Isn't that good? So Jonah's message was just that, to preach against the city. They were in a terrible place. They were a sinful city. To call them to repentance and to offer redemption. Nineveh was wicked. There are cities There are people, there are families that are wicked. And they will be held accountable to God. But that's not the whole story. Listen to Psalm 67, verse 4. Let the nations rejoice and shout for joy. For you judge the peoples with fairness, and you lead the nations on earth. God hates sin, but he loves sinners. Aren't you glad? Wherever they're from, red, yellow, black, white. They're precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Here's the way Jesus said it. A little different than that rhyme. He says, For God loved the world in this way that He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes, everyone's a really important word in the Bible, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. So in preaching against the foreign city of Nineveh, Jonah would offer them mercy. He would offer them hope. He would offer them forgiveness. He would offer a future for them. While his buddies, while his king wanted their destruction, Jonah would offer their deliverance. Faithfulness to God would at least appear to be unfaithfulness to Israel. Faithfulness to God would appear to become treasonous. Faithfulness to God would jeopardize his condo next to the king's palace. Faithfulness to God wouldn't look very faithful. Sometimes it's just hard to imagine That God loves our enemies as much as He loves us. Sometimes it's hard to imagine giving our very best to people who will seek our very worst. Sometimes it's hard to imagine giving our lives for people that we've learned to despise and view as an enemy that should be destroyed. It's so hard to imagine, I think, because we're quick to forget that we too were enemies of God. Romans 5 says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by His life? You see, the problem is with those other people, and we are those other people. The mercy of God calls us to show the unlovables who are down the hall, across the street, across the aisle, around the world. It's called to show them the same mercy that we needed in our best moment apart from God's grace. And when God sends us to the unlovables, it's an act of divine mercy, isn't it? It's a divine mercy to them that they have the privilege of hearing the gospel, responding to the gospel, being transformed. And this enemy now becomes a brother or sister in Christ. But it's also a divine mercy to you and me. Those of us who are in Christ, 
we have the blessing of him looking past our unsanctified, darkened soul self, unfinished self, him inviting us to represent him, to embody incarnationally the ministry of mercy. Uh, we're at a place in life now, uh, Deborah and I are, that uh, three of our kids are you know, kind of making their own way, They're carrying our name. We've got a teenager who bears our last name. Unfinished, unformed. But when those kids behave, they represent me and her mom. Unfinished, unformed, yet embodying a, a family uh, character, whatever it may be. In a similar way, we are privileged to embody this Christ life unformed and unfinished, but that he mercifully allows us to represent him. Someone has said that missionaries are simply one beggar telling another beggar where we found bread. That's true, but we're pretty well-fed beggars, you know, right? We've, been, we've received abundant grace to give to those who are across the aisle, across the street, around the world, whatever it is. You say, well, Daryl, I'm, I'm really not a missionary, you know. That's what Jonah said. And a fish gobbled him up. So perhaps this is a moment. That God speaks. You're going to miss it. This distance between what he says and what he does, what you do, can be closed by the gracious work of God. Would you pray with me? Father, we, we, like, we like Jonah. We like the story. We're so grateful for it that it's, um, it is... It is a reminder of your supernatural work in the world. We're enamored by the elements of this story. They fascinate us. We also relate to this prophet. Like we relate to him. We love you. We love our country. We, we want to love our neighbors well. We want to love the world. But... Loving other people the way you love us, a place where we find our souls are a little bit like Swiss cheese. There's just a lot of holes in that. And it is only a work of your grace and goodness and our cooperation with your Holy Spirit That will form us, and fashion us. Lord, while we are worried about the world and how it's going, your priority seems to be working in us. We'll find that to be the fruit of that to bear out in this story along the way, but Lord, we just say up front right now that the person in the mirror is the object of your greatest grace. But we need you today. We confess to you that we've heard you say a lot of things that we have justified and rationalized and minimized ultimately ignored and moved on and we're still babes in Christ depending upon cliches and conventional wisdom that we inherited somewhere along the way 
born out of pain or insecurity or fear. Lord, I pray that today you would do fresh work in my life, our lives, that the light of the gospel, the glory of God, Christ in you, be proclaimed so that we may present every man, every woman, every boy and girl complete in Christ. If you're just in a posture of prayer here in the room online, you may be looking at me or getting another cup of coffee or whatever it is, but if you just take a moment and ask the question, are you in Christ? He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. The following and the fishing, they go the t- together. You don't become a follower of Christ without becoming a missionary on His behalf. Making much of Jesus. So you follow Him today? Will you trust Him as the Lord of your life? If that's you, we would love to talk with you after this service. We'd love to connect with you online. We'd love to know how we can come beside you. But don't let this moment pass. Don't ignore what the Lord is speaking to you even today. And some of you are here, many of us are here today, and we would say we're in Christ. We would say that we're followers of Christ. Like Jonah, we're believers. Will you take these next seven weeks with us and just see what few sacred moments with God might do in your life. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the local church, all that you're doing in us as we make much of Jesus. We pray in his name. Pastor Casey's going to come and share a few closing things with you. Thank you for your Attention today, it is a privilege to preach uh, to the people of God, family of faith known as Green Hill Church, so thank you. Um, We are, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in a season of prayer this week, and we will, uh, um, you know, it's election day on Tuesday, did y'all know that? I got my my election day socks on, and um, so I'm all about it. Um. But um, we're going to have a prayer meeting on Wednesday night. So just I would just ask you to come. We're going to sing. We're going to pray. We're going to sing. We're going to pray. We're not going to ask you to like come up on the stage and pray. But we are going to ask you to engage in prayer with us. And uh, we're going to try to social distance, keep everybody safe and healthy. But we um, want you to come and pray. Um, perhaps. He would hear us from heaven as we respond to his voice in our lives. So we're trusting him for that. So um, I'll see you Wednesday night. Casey's got a few instructions for us, and then we'll be done. We do have that uh, prayer service on Wednesday at 6 o'clock. And if you uh, are wondering about child care, we will have child care for uh, preschool age uh, for that night. So please come and be a part of that event with us. Um, If you came prepared to give today, you can give uh, in the boxes in the hallway, or uh, you can go to greenhillchurch.com, and you can pray in that way as well. This is the last uh, Sunday to pick up your Operation Christmas Child boxes. Um, They're in the hallway today. A lot of you guys picked those up last week, but we uh, have more out there for you guys. If you are a part of our online audience, you can come by and get those anytime uh, this week to get your box. When you go to your table, you want to make sure that you get one of these labels. On this label, it'll give you an option to uh, uh, do a boy box or a girl box. And it'll also give you some good instructions on the back about things to put in your box. It may be some things not to put uh, in your box as well. There's also They also ask for a donation to uh, help with the shipping costs, and you can put that in your box Or I would encourage you to use this, and you can go online and do your uh, payment online so you can track your box. And if you have little ones at home, I would really encourage you to do this to uh, track your box so you can know where your box uh, goes this year. There's also a cool feature as well. 
If you uh, feel uncomfortable about a box, uh, going and shopping for a box, or maybe you're part of the online audience that's not getting out much, you can also do an online box. And you can go to greenhillchurch.com and do that box, and it'll take you through step by step. And there's a way that you can shop just like you're shopping online and put different things in your box. So it's a really cool uh, option for you this year that you can do an online box. We've done it all for you online. Just go through our website, greenhillchurch.com. You'll see an opportunity for you to do it, an online uh, box. So make sure you go out there and see Miss Kathy uh, today and get your uh, box uh, in the hallway. Also, we are going to be uh, presenting the budget on uh, November 22nd for the uh, 2021 uh, ministry year. And we'll present that on the 22nd. We'll have a question and answer opportunity for you guys on December the uh, 6th. And that will be down in the fellowship hall right after this service. Or you could uh, do it on Zoom as well if you have any questions about the ministry budget. And then we will uh, ask for approval, the congregational approval for that budget on uh, December the 13th. There's also a, a women's event that's coming up December the 5th. And then uh, in January, there is also going to be a men's event toward the end of January. So go ahead and start thinking about those things and putting those uh, on your uh, calendar. In Next Gen News, we are still looking for uh, four volunteers, two in the first hour and two in the second hour, to help in uh, preschool ministry and kids ministry. So if you're interested in that, uh, you could uh, talk to Miss Kathy at the Operation Christmas Child uh, table today. And uh, she could tell you where those exact needs are and what those uh, look like. Also, uh, we'll be having a base camp tonight for student ministry here uh, on campus from 5 to 8 o'clock tonight. So if you have a child that's uh, in that age group, we'd love to have them come and participate with us uh, tonight. Thanks for being here today. You guys are sent.